So you'd think that after that last long episode, I'd actually have all these things all fully dimensioned, but we still have a pair of rip cuts to make besides the cross cuts on the sides for the compound angles. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, so these are all the parts after the last episode. Now there is two stacks because I am making two of these. So this one here was made off camera and I'll be kind of doing it just along the way every now and then. You'll, you'll, you'll see it in, in background stacks is where it'll be. So in this episode, we're going to be spending a lot of time with this crosscut sled that I made and described in the jigs episode. So let me take this to the table saw and I'll explain a couple things about the way the cuts work and the way that we can take advantage of the mirror image so that we can do a long setup for the one cut and then we can actually blast through six or in my case 12 cuts all in one shot. Before we get to cross cutting this stock and then eventually getting to beveling doing the rip cuts for the final dimensioning, I wanted to go over a couple things about this sled that came up as questions after my jigs video. So now the sled itself, as you saw before, just has some of this hardware. What this hardware is, is it's 5 sixteenths T-bolts. So you can see that there's a little T-bolt that can pop out of a recess back here. Now the other question was about this clamp that I'm using down here for holding the triangles. Now this one here, let me remove it for a moment to explain this better. So when I made this clamp here for holding down the triangles, you know, I had to cut away a little bit of a notch here so that the bolt can go through it. And then it's just a simple knob that just spins down and then squeezes it. So I don't have to worry about when I'm trying to do a cut and I put a board on there and I'm sliding it side to side that when I'm pressing this down, I don't have to worry about this triangle scooting off to the side. Now, because I need to be able to reverse these triangles and flip it, I needed an equal notch on the other side so that when I flip this over, that notch goes over that screw and it can be locked in place there. So having a hole there already, I placed the T-bolt there so that I could use one of these clamps in order to hold the stock in place. So if I had some stock there to cut, I can clamp that down in place right there. So what I'd like to do is show you how I would cut, say, in this case, the left rear facet. So I have the left rear facet board here, and I want to show you how I would set up that cut. Now, I've already set the bevel of the blade, and I'll show you that in a moment, how we're going to do that. But these guidelines, like I had explained to you before, these are strictly guides. When I use the triangles in order to draw these lines, or I use the mock-up part to transfer the lines to the board, I don't use those lines for putting the board on here and sliding it side to side in order to get the thing to go straight into the blade to set the angle. That is dictated exclusively by the triangle. So if I slide the triangle here in place, now when I want to make this cut, I simply put this board up against it, and as I'm scooting it side to side, this cut line is moving parallel to that blade. So all I need to do is eyeball down the blade and down the line until they line right up. And it's actually pretty quick. What you're going to want to do is rotate something like this so that you get the tooth right where you're sighting because that's of course fatter than the saw plate. And that would be it right there. Now I've already set the bevel and I'll show you that in a moment with the angle master. So now one thing to remember is what I discussed earlier about the mirroring effect that we have on this project. So this is the left side and this is the left rear facet. So when I go to assemble this, that's the angle that I've got. That's the angle that I'm going to be cutting to get a nice clean joint. Now it turns out that this is the right rear facet. So if I put this here on the table and I get this all nicely lined up. So now these two angles are mirrors from each other. This is the right to the right rear facet and this is the left to the left rear facet. So if we took a look at these boards, these are the outside edges. The miters go opposite directions. That's just flipping the triangle. So it works out really well that as you're looking at this project, on the hole from the top. If I start on one of the back angles, it's very easy for me to do that joint as well as the mirror image joint together. And then as I progress up, I can go around and do it. And recall that all three levels, the compound angles are all the same on all the corners of them. So, so when I do the lower drawer assembly, I can also make that exact same compound cut on the one in the middle and the one on the top. All that changes on those boards is, of course, their, their width on here, so it's a little bit wider, but also they're longer. The length is the difference between those on all these boards. So it makes it that if you have a decent idea of this whole mirror imaging thing, you can make this cutting going a lot faster than me explaining it. So another thing to think about with the bevel angle, on any one of the corners, like in this case here, the left side, the left back facet, anytime you have a miter joint like this, the bevel cut on both of these boards is identical. So that also means that when we're looking at this at the top and there's eight compound angles on one side, there's only four unique bevel cuts 
on that one side, and those four are mirrored onto the other side. It turns out that as long as I do something like one of the back corners, and then you know do its back cut, and then the back cut for the right side, and then the front side of that same angle on the left, and then the front side of that same angle on the right, I've made four cuts with only one bevel setting. So it makes it nice that you get that repeatability, and of course the time you take for getting this thing set up properly is really saved in the end. So now knowing what the bevel angle is going to be, you know, I know that it's 48.6 millimeters on here, so let me set this to 48.6. And normally what I do is that I'll place this on the table because it's magnetic, it's going to snap down, so this is perfect. What I'll do is I'll make sure that the tilt is greater than the angle master what we're trying to get. So let me crank this down a little bit more. I also like to have the blade up high. I want a lot of registration to the, to the little registration surface that we have here on the angle master because it's going to make it clearer when we've got the thing set. So then you scoot this thing over and you touch the plate. Try to make sure that there's no tooth here in the way because you're going to want it to be on the saw plate when it touches and registers with the angle master. Now the other thing that you want to do when you're using this angle master is usually while I'm doing the work, of course I've got the sled in place. Now if I put this sled back and I push it up to where the angle master is, you can see that this isn't flush. It's actually bumping against that and moving it. So you don't want to put this thing down on top of the slide because it's actually going to change the angle. It's just something to keep aware of while you're setting this up. Now the other thing you're going to want to make sure you do is when you line this up, make sure you're lining it up pretty much, you'll just eyeball it to be perpendicular to the blade. If you have it here, or you have it here, that's a different angle. Just like when you're taking a hand plane and you skew the plane, you're giving it a different attack. As you skew it, you're lowering the angle. When you're skewing this, you're changing the angle so that it's actually going to be less of a tilt. So just eyeball it to 90 degrees, make sure there's no tooth in the way, make it touch the blade. When it touches the blade, because it's magnetic, as I change the bevel on the blade and I move it up to match this tool, it's going to push this over onto the table and it's going to keep a nice snug fit. It makes it super easy. So now you just crank it up. Go until you don't see the light. Just killed it. To me that's set. And now I'm going to be able to make four cuts with this setting. So if we do this left facet, we're going to put this on the board, snap the triangle in place, lock it down. And actually, I had it right when I put it down. <laughs> so now to lock this in place, I can use this, but it just barely reaches over. So generally what I do, I have this other board that I use. It's just a simple piece of scrap. I put 120 grit PSA on it. So in order to help hold this here in place, I just take this other piece that's the same thickness, put it around here. Now I place this board on top with the, with the sandpaper on there, it's going to really grip that board. And now it's easier for me to be able to get both clamps engaged on this. There we go. Now that's going to help hold that into place. Now to demonstrate more what I mean by being able to mirror image the cut, this one here was the left rear facet that we just cut. This one here is the right rear facet. So there's a complementary angle on this one. That was the other board that I showed. All I need to do now for this board is take the triangle out, flip the triangle to get the miter angle to the opposite side, and lock it back into place here on the... And now when I place this here, that's lined up perfectly. Just sight down the blade and align it. Let me put this here since I already know I'm going to be using that. So this was for the topmost box, because these are the smaller pieces. But what I can do now is with this same setup, same bevel angle, I can go ahead and I can grab the middle shelf and then the bottom shelf pieces, and I can go ahead and cut those same angles on them. And then once I'm done with that, then I can move to the other angle that uses the same bevel, and that is the side. I'm just trying to make this thing sound really complicated so that you're like all impressed and stuff. It's not all that hard. There we go. Now with that, 
one side of that corner is done on both mirrored sides. So now leave that at the same bevel. So now that we've done this side of the angle, we're going to go ahead and move to the sides and we're going to be doing the rearmost angle, rearmost miter of the sides. So the next thing that we need to do with these boards is we've already done the compound cuts that are on either end. Now in a way we're going to complete the rip because the rip needs to have some bevels put on the top and the bottom. Now the reason for this is this is a piece from the mock-up so you're going to be able to see it. This one here is inclined when it's assembled so we need a bevel on the bottom so that this can be flat and the top can be flat so that this is going to be parallel to the bottom while it's inclined. So this is one of the side pieces and it's tilted 15.524 degrees, uh, very precise, and that's actually going to be the tilt that we set on the saw. So we're going to tilt this blade down at 15.524 degrees, and then we're going to run this board. Uh, first we're going to run it like face down this way here, then flip it over, and then run it the other way, and that's going to give us the two parallel sides. Now I pushed the fence out of the way so that you'd be able to see this more clearly, but on the longer boards like this, we're going to go ahead and do uh, the sides and the front using just a rip fence. So we're going to run it through the one way, flip it over, and then do it the other way. Now it's not just a matter of running it through twice like that. We do have to get the width correct, and the width is different because of the inclination. Now the topmost box is going to be four and a half inches thick, but of course that's a different width for a board inclined this much versus a board inclined this much. So each one of them has a different width. Now the way that I'm going to be keeping the grain continuous is I'm going to try using only the top as my reference surface. So this is one of the sideboards. The top of it here is what I'm going to be considering my reference surface. So when I go to cut this bevel, I'm going to make it that the blade is just skimming along this topmost edge right here. I want it to cut the bevel flush to that top edge. I mean, if it takes off a hair off of that top edge, that's not going to be a problem. But I want to try keeping this as my alignment point because then when everything is tilted over, this is the same all the way around. Then for the different widths, depending on the inclination, you know, and the different parts, well then that other side is cut to a different width. So I'm going to go ahead and run the bevels for the sides and the fronts because that's going to be with the fence. But then I'm going to show you how to use the crosscut sled in order to do the smaller pieces. One of the tricks I like to do when I'm trying to just lop off that top edge is if it's a relatively shallow angle, if I were to leave a little flat on this top edge, it's going to be really hard to see until you do the assembly and then you're going to see this little what would look like a chamfer when it's on the incline. So you really want to make sure you get that absolute top edge 
gone. So what I did on the mock-up that made it a whole heck of a lot easier is I just took one of these really fat pencils and you just rub it along this line. So I have it rubbed on this line here. There's none on the face. There's only some on the side, but it goes all the way up to that top edge. As long as there's no pencil mark when I'm done, I know that I'll have had that cut properly. Now for the widths of these top boards, with the incline, this one here, it's supposed to be 4.5 inches. Uh, I do everything in metric when it comes to doing these numbers because it's a whole lot easier for me to eyeball 118.6 than some crazy fraction that we like to, to haul around in the imperial system. That's the width of this face. It doesn't care how far this part here goes out when it's off on the bevel. It strictly cares about the flat of this face. So what I need to do on these boards is Okay, there's the bevel on this side. I need to mark the board so that when I go to run this thing through, this way, I'm gonna know where to line up the blade. Now, you know, the, the two sides that are for the top are gonna have the same setting, so I only need that on one board, but I'll need to make a setting board for each one of the different layers. So now, for marking this, what's easy to do, this one's 118.6 millimeters, so I set my square to 118.6 millimeters, you put it here, now because of the, of the miter and stuff, you know, you can see that there's no, nothing square going on there. But what I care about is the square distance, okay? So I don't want to put the, I don't want to put the ruler on here following the miter. That would be incorrect. You need this thing to be square on the bottom. And basically, mark it where it pops out on the board over here. So I'm going to mark where that is up on the top of the board, and that's what I'm going to use to line up the blade. When we're cutting these bevels on these larger pieces, super easy just to push that up against the fence, not a problem at all. When we get to some of these smaller pieces like this, so these are on the bottom box, well, these are really long and narrow. So if we're trying to push this up against the fence over here, you're just in a precarious situation there. It's gonna wanna, you know, if you twist it at all, it's gonna throw it back at you. It's gonna make a mess of the cut. It's just plain dangerous and a bad idea. So what I do is I use the crosscut sled for doing that. But of course, now I've got these mitered edges on the side. So how am I going to line this up straight? Now, it turns out that this, what we're looking at here is the right front facet. So just a front facet. They're both mirror images of each other, so we can use the same type of setup. But what I need to do is I need to be able to hold this square. Now, I'm not going to be able to put this here, and I could always... I could always feel up against the edge here and see, well, how square is that? But while that might work, you know, there's room for error with that. But worse is that I actually need this part to be over more so that the bevel cut goes down. So in a way, I would have to know the exact distance that's going to be off the bottom, draw a straight line, look at it from underneath to line it up, then clamp it in place. It's a pain in the butt. So if this is square on the bottom and this is the miter angle, that we have on this board, if I take this and I spin it around, then I'm gonna be squaring up the piece. So let me show you. But this is where, this is the side I wanna cut first, this top edge. So you can see that if I were to stick this triangle in here, which is the one that made that miter, and I slide that down there, I'm square on this edge. And the best part is, is I can slide this all I want and this edge is always going to stay parallel to this cut line. I already cut this to the bevel that we're setting on the top and the bottom on this piece. So it's really nice that I can very easily make this cut. Now that we're all completely confused, I'm just going to go cut some pieces.
already done the cut this way in order to make the bevel. So what I need to do is just like we did when we did the rip cuts, I need to now put it face down to make the other one so that we get you know parallel bevels on the top and the bottom so that it's you know got flat surfaces when it's inclined. So what I need to do is I need to rotate this. Now fortunately, it's the same triangle. Except we need to flip it. And now things line up just fine. But one of the things that's a little bit awkward with dealing with these pieces is trying to mark that face distance. Unlike with the fence. With the fence, of course, after I mark the first board, I can run all of them through. But these ones here are different because there is no fence out here. So the easiest way to do it is that I mark one board, I'm gonna put it on here, and I'm gonna, you know, line it up for the cut just like I did for the other ones. And once it's lined up, I'm gonna make a pencil mark right here, just on the MDF. Then when I switch to the next board, all I'm going to have to do is scoot this over until it reveals the line, and then I can make the cut. So just, it's a whole lot easier to just write on the MDF and make the marks as you go along. And it's only going to be for three sizes, and it's going to be really obvious when I put this one on that it's not lining up with this one over here. So it makes it pretty quick and easy that way to get through all the sizes. So now having these mock-up boards is really great because I can actually put this here. Normally I would have to do the measurement like I indicated where I mark one, put it on here, and then draw the line so that I can repeat. But having these, I just gotta put it on there because I have a zero clearance insert exactly where that blade is cutting. That feels dead smooth. Let me just mark a line. And now I can just line up my piece right to that line, and make the cut. Just like that, stock dimensioning. 